Toby. I think he said maybe the last week on Tuesday that school was boring. And, and I generally agree with you on that. But how would you feel with the statement that school may be boring, but learning is interesting? So I don't, I don't think necessarily school and learning, at least here, are as tied together as they might be in other places, or as one might think. It's like the act of going to school might be boring, but if you actually get to learn something, you know, it's interesting. I agree with you. Um, <laughs> There are some footnotes. I don't know if you want to go into it. Would you? Okay. When you say learning, do you mean like just hello? Are the kids? It depends what you learn. I think initially everything that you learn could be interesting. Consider for a moment that you go out with someone and you want to, you're curious initially about them, you want to learn a few things about their history, and so they tell you. And you're a man, supposedly, and um, you know, in some ways we're all, as Jean-Jacques Rousseau would say, we like to help other people as much as we can. So you go out with this woman or this man or whatever, and they tell you this really, really sad story about their life. You know, and all of us are to some extent moved by empathy, and uh, that's a trap. It's not really set up by them, it's just, just the way we function. We are moved by empathy. You know, you're a firefighter. Initially, it's the fire that kind of devastates you, and then the next is when people come to you and say, I lost my house, I lost my wife, and this and that, and then you kind of feel paralyzed. And so they give you data about their life, chunks of information. and. Information can do a few things for you. It can either make you think or it can make you feel. Initially, all data or information, they make you feel, you know. And then um, you have to figure out what you want to do with the feelings. First, it has to be you trying to figure out what you want to do with the way they feel about stuff. And then you have to figure out how you feel about the stuff that they're telling you as well as how they're feeling. Then you begin to learn about stuff. And then the next big thing is, well, what do you want to do with the things that you learn now? I understand initially things are interesting. You know? I mean, ask any one of us in this classroom who had children, they'll tell you. It's interesting initially, you know? You know, you learn what to do with them when they walk and when they run. And then you realize that your kids belong to the social structure, i.e. Oakland, i.e. violence, i.e. poverty, i.e. homelessness. You've learned all the stuff. And all of a sudden you realize what you've learned actually becomes a burden. And somehow you want to get rid of it. But you don't know how. So the more you learn, the more burden you feel, and the more your back bends. And before you know it, you're just laying on the ground, seeking or asking for help. You know, learning is not that difficult. Anyone can go to school and learn. Uh, you know, one of the difficulties that happened when people began to read or write is that there came this new assumption that just because you go to school and just because you're able to learn new things that you actually mature in understanding. You ripen as, as a human being, you evolve, you progress. And that's actually not the case. You know, what you usually have with people like me who go to school, earn a degree and come to class and just yap on endlessly 
is that you give the illusion that you have not just knowledge but wisdom and that means you know how to apply the knowledge that you have in a way that's helpful to yourself and other people you know in the past that wasn't the case people learn by practical experiences they kind of were engaged in life you know you didn't have to go to a workshop to learn how to be patient to learn how to kind of manage your anger you had like five or six kids you know you have to take care of your parents your reputation mattered, so you just have to kind of be careful what you say, how you say it, to whom you say it. And that's how you learn. And just in case you kind of uh, slipped, your parents, your neighbors, society at large will kind of tell you. You know? Uh, you know, one of the most basic things that people used to do on a daily basis, for example, if you walk into a class, you look at the people, especially your instructor, and you say hello. You could actually hear it. But that's a forgotten art. You know, so the task now is to teach someone this forgotten art. And they have to learn it. The problem with learning is you have to make sure you don't forget it. Now, you know that as you get older, and as you have less space and less patience, and less really interest in things, especially new things, it's not enough for you to learn something today and forget tomorrow. Because learning is supposed to be something that's transformative. Uh, and it's, it's a relatively difficult thing to do. I mean, the truth is most of the philosophers and the sages that we've had over the course of you know, human history, all they really wanted to do was to teach us something very simple, human decency. Just think and reflect a little bit. And it's been a very, very difficult path for all of us. Next time you have a companion, and should your companion like Rebecca keep a journal in which all the secrets are being written down? Well, uh, you know, look under the mattress. And then uh, read what they have written. You've learned a few things, and then see what happens to you. You know, I mean, you guys have been together for a year or so, and they just call her Jacqueline. And Jacqueline says, well, you know, I went to the coffee shop and I met Bob, he was my ex, and we held hands and we talked, and I still have strong feelings for him. Well, damn, you've learned something new today. I'm not sure if that's liberating or burdensome. You know, and then the task is for you to come home and see, okay, well, how are you going to manage this relationship with this new information that you have? And the truth is, because of our culture, because of the way we have defined relationships and monogamy and all that stuff, uh, you're overcome with anger and jealousy. I mean, all of us want to learn, right? But you have no idea what learning does to you. You know, it's like we go to you and people and say, be honest with me, please. You know, that's fine. It's a great thing to say. How do I look? <laughs> what do you want me to say? You look bad? And then what? What's the price for that? Sleeping on the sofa? No, of course not. You look great. I have never seen anyone more dazzling than you. You know. And I think it's a uh, it's fashionable these days to say I'm here to learn. You know, I can actually kind of like Jesus Christ. I can because learning is kind of like carrying a cross. Uh, there's a story about the Jewish philosopher Martin Buber. Uh, he has a story that there was a penny that he found, or some coin, on the ground. So he bent over to pick it up, to put it in his pocket, but he couldn't lift it. It's a penny. I mean, all of you guys know what a penny is. I'm sure you've kind of bent over and picked a few here and there, and uh, he couldn't. And then people passing him by make fun of him. You know, what the hell is wrong with you? Just, just pick up. He says, I can't. Why, they ask. Because this penny has this penny has brought some joy, some sorrow, some have uh, treated it with indifference. And uh, I mean, imagine for a moment that you're a penny short on your rent, and your landlord will kick you out. It's not like today where you have to file papers with the court and it takes like five months. You know, it's immediate. And so you have all this fear, you know, anxiety, stress, frustration. 
anger. I mean, that's inside the penny. Now imagine you have heard the story and you most likely you've learned a few things from it. Now go apply it today. It's kind of like what Henry David Thoreau used to say about eating pizza. I'm not sure if it's a true story or not, but it's something I read. You know, maybe he was using his cell phone, I don't know. It's um, that it takes really the entire universe to come together. The wind, the sun, water, light, all that stuff, to come together to make you know, wheat. And then you need manpower to grind it. And then to go somewhere and get some wood. Then to put, you know, create some fire. So all the stuff that needs to happen for you to kind of be able to nourish yourself, it's just practically very difficult, nearly impossible. So it's best, best to remain... Wasn't there a show called Dumbo? To remain dumb. Because then you have no responsibilities. What you don't know won't haunt you. But I understand, you know, being young, and all that stuff. I haven't gone to Kaiser for a long, long time. And uh, we usually, culturally, don't like to go to hospitals. Because culturally, we are wired in a certain way that the moment you're born, you're kind of born to be dark, gloomy, because of our history, uh, the events that history has created. So we know how we deal with you know, events quite gloomy. Now imagine if I was to go to the doctors and they would say, you should have come a couple months earlier, you have stage four cancer. What do you think I'm going to do? Go out there and look for a remedy? No. I've learned something new about my body, my biology. I'm going to sit home, uh, not want to see my wife or my kids or anybody. Like a dog, you know, when they know they're going to die, they're going to go into the woods very quietly by their lonesome, and they slowly die. That's the way we function. So it depends what stage of learning you're interested in. Consider the, uh, one of the noble truths in Buddhism. All of life is suffering. That's something you've learned today. Well, if you scratch the surface, you have no idea where you may end up. You're 19 or 18 right now, if you were to truly examine that first noble truth, by the time you're 22, 23, you may be suffering from chronic depression. Not because of brain chemistry, but because, and not because of what society has done to you, but because you, for the first time, come to realize why the Buddha, some 3,000 years ago almost, mentioned that life is all suffering. That may stop you from having relationships, going to school, making money, even maybe laughing, showering, shaving. It's best not to learn. Or at least if you want to learn, be very, very selective as to what it is that you want to learn. And there are a couple of things uh, in the path of learning. There is what we call conformity. And then there is this other path called authenticity. I'm not talking about Martin Heidegger. Uh, consider for a moment that you have been out of school for some time now versus someone who's been continuously going to school. You know what you need to do on Tuesday and Thursdays. You wake up at about 8, 8.39. You wash your face, take a shower, you come to class. You just ask, where is G266? All the signposts are there. Now, you're young, you need to conform. There is nothing wrong with it. There is a good amount of security, you know, in it. Comfortability, stability, and conformity. So just because people conform, it doesn't mean that it's bad. You know, there is no reason to demonize conformity because that's what we do. That's what we've been doing for thousands of years. At the moment we were able to tame animals, this is like the Neolithic Stone Age era about 30,000 years ago. The moment you're able to tame animals, the moment you're able to kind of make two by fours, you know, get studs and build them into like a shelter, 
you have civilization. You have a society. You know what happens when you settle down? You create stories. And you create stories because you become attached. And I'm not talking about intellectual attachment. You're talking about emotional attachments. You know, so all the stuff that you find on YouTube about people telling you, don't be attached, be free, it's not part of our system. You have no choice but to become attached. And um, the moment you have society, you have an organization, you have signposts, you have conformity, you have do's and don'ts. Now imagine that at the age of 25, you come to realize that everything you've learned is no good. It doesn't nourish you anymore. It's like a relationship gone bad. Now you want to be authentic. Now you want to figure out what you really, really enjoy, what moves you. So what you do is, hopefully, you know, no one is wearing masks anymore, so you walk to Laney College, or maybe in somewhere else, some institution. And um, all you do is you walk from classroom to classroom. You just open the door, you look at the instructor, you listen to what he or she is saying for about no more than maybe a minute or two. Remember, human beings have great antennas. You know when something moves you. And that can be somewhat dangerous. Initially, it's interesting, passionate. But then it becomes very dangerous because it has a power to kind of turn yourself, your life upside down. And, you know, Laney has about 300 classrooms. It means that from 9 in the morning, you have to kind of open the classroom doors, you know, uh, put your head in, sit there for a minute or two, and then walk out. And then you realize that it's a very exhausting process because you've come to realize that you have all these people with degrees and they're not saying anything. So where do you go from Laney? You go to BCC? Maybe you go like Chris to UC Berkeley. Maybe like a friend that we both have who's going to Yale currently. Maybe you'll go to Yale and realize that it's just no good. What do you do then? Now that is called being authentic. Wanting to hear something that moves you from within. It's intuitive. There are no signposts. There are no books. It's chaotic, it's dark, it's gloomy. It's kind of like what, um, who was that guy, Dante? In the middle of my years, I found myself in the woods, completely dark. It was Dante, no? Yeah, some Italian poet. So, uh, we have another half hour. Anyone else? Did that answer your no? You made me think. I'm sorry. Yeah. We should not do that. Try not to. Bridget. Yes. Um, can we really uh, have control over that? Because, like, when you refer to the the emergency situation, the firefighter gets information and uh, it uh, becomes empathy. Uh, he tries to work on his, with his feeling. He tries to find out what to do. How about? Yes. You might not just close it up and abandon it. Why don't you think of what do I do with this? Bridget, there is something really interesting about human beings. You're here for one reason. Do you know what that is? Forgive me for speaking on your behalf. You're here because of hope. Every single person you see in this room, they're here because of hope. They are hoping for something. And that hope usually lives in the future. So to get to this future, you make a sacrifice. You take a boring class to get to this place called hope. Now, your question is interesting, but 
it's also quite simple in this particular way. Every new relationship, it doesn't matter with what, whether it's buying a dog or a cell phone or getting into any relationship or having children, they're all inspirational. They inspire dreams and hopes. It's like a castle somewhere out there. When time gets into this thing, into this relationship, you know what time does? Time does what it usually does very, very, very finely, which is it begins to decay and corrode the thing. Time creates rust. The dazzle, the glimmers, they go away. So kids used to be fun, but now they are burdensome. Marriage used to be fun, interesting, but now they feel like a cage. Learning used to be fun, but now it's burdensome. One of the things that time does, it's no different than the saying of the Buddha, that life is suffering. It doesn't matter what you touch. It doesn't matter what package you get. Open it. After a while, you realize that the package sits somewhere, or the contents, and it has created clutter. Clutter. And you want to get rid of it. Most often, go to Berkeley, uh, especially when the semester ends, especially for students who are graduating. They leave outside furniture, good furniture. I mean, it's almost like brand new. They just no longer want it. They don't want to carry them. Once in a while, I just go around neighborhoods on Thursdays when there is bulk pickup. They put brand new TVs, you know, wonderful stuff out there. Clutter. What time usually does to all of us, it makes us tired of the things that we have. It makes us tired of yourself as well. The contents of the package, they are irrelevant. It doesn't matter what you get. You may desire to be with Brad Pitt, Angelina Jolie, buy a Tesla. None of those things really matter because they're all going to be impacted by time. And time only really has one function, to destroy it. You know, immigrants, they usually dream about coming to America. I'm not talking about immigrants from New Zealand, for example, or Canada. I'm talking about people in the third world country where their hopes have been shattered by just civilization, their society, government, politics, superpowers. You know, they do lottery. They sign their name somewhere, they send it in, and all of a sudden they get a call. Out of like thousands, if not millions of people, you get 10,000 people who win the lottery to come to the US. It's beautiful, it's great to have dreams. You know. And they realize once they come here, I mean, it's, it's fun getting a job, being able to buy a house, car, things that you can't really afford in your own country. But then you realize that you wake up at six in the morning and your day starts. You have no rest. There is no siesta. At least, you know, even if you're in a third world country, you come home, you have lunch, if not with your family, at least with your friends. You lay on the grass on your bed, you sleep till about three or four, and then you go to work for about two, three hours, and you come home, take a shower, and have fun with your friends and family. There is none of that in this country. And eventually what began as a fantasy, a hopeful fantasy, it turns disastrous. It doesn't mean that you're not grateful. But it means that you're now in an environment that's basically just sucking your soul out of you. That's what time does. Consider another example. Let's say that I was to talk about, forgive me, say abortion or LGBT community. And let's say you've had a personal experience, or you've known someone who's had personal experience. Now remember, this is a philosophy class. But because of an experience that has touched you deeply and intensely, what do you do? Instead of listening to the entire conversation, you select pieces that triggers you. 
And because it's a culture that revolves around trauma, and everybody needs to confess something, it means that you have to be very careful what you say because people are not listening to the entire conversation or the intention of the conversation or the context of the conversation. Everyone engages in selective hearing. Now, there is really only one important component to listen to. You're 18, do not be selective. Because your matrix about right and wrong, good or bad, fun and pain, they're all wrong. You don't have enough life experience. You're 18. You know, but when you live in a culture where you're made into an individual and it gives you rights and a sense of entitlement, it's going to be very, very difficult to overcome those obstacles. Rebecca, you're not writing anything down. I feel useless, as if I'm not saying anything noteworthy. I'm sorry. Yes. JJ, you have two hands up. Correct. What is it? Nothing. Nothing? Okay. Anyone else? Chris? Jamie. Anything? Look? Paula? Oh. I'm sorry? We relate wisdom with age. I relate wisdom with age? Oh, I said we do, like as a, as a, as a, as a society, right? Okay. The older you are, the more wisdom you possess, right? <clears throat> and I'm just wondering, does that, what was this, is that okay? I can't really agree. That's okay, yeah. Um, yeah. Does that, do we, do we do that because we think of life experiences that they've gained, right? throughout these years, but what if you have someone who's lived a shorter amount of time but have had a, a multitude of, of, of experiences under their belt that maybe someone with longevity in, in years has not? Do, like what makes us say, well, you're not wise enough, I can't listen to you. Or, I mean, in my case, I'll listen to, to everyone, but if we, we relate wisdom with age, what about experience? Can I ask you a question? Imagine for a moment I'm a woman. Can you imagine that? Long hair and all that. And imagine for a moment that I am 20. How old are you? 31. I'm 21. And I come to you and be a friend. And we've been friends for like, I don't know, two weeks. And I come to you and I say, Paula, I have fallen in love and this guy wants to marry me. Give me some of your wisdom. Okay. Yes. Like what would I say to my friends? Um, it's me. Call me Amira. <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, I, I want to know if I should say yes or no or maybe to this man. Now remember, I am in love. <laughs> Be gentle, Polo. I mean, I, I, I honestly, like, I know people that have had relation, or been in relationships for years, and they've never felt love. They've, they've felt other things for their partners, but not necessarily love, so I don't, I don't know who I am to, to be able oh, to tell Paula. someone Paula, you're such a useless friend. <laughs> I mean, I've been told I'm unenabling friends. <laughs> that makes sense. Paula, I am here seeking your advice. You know, it's like when you watch the, the show on TV, Shark Tank. I am here seeking $300,000 for 5% of my you know, company. I am here giving you my time for 5% of your wisdom. Now give it to me. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Allahu Akbar. Okay. 
let me first throw this out that I don't think anyone knows what wisdom is. So that in itself is quite foggy. Okay? The next thing is I'm not really quite sure how wisdom is expressed. Okay? That also is a little foggy, uncertain. I'm not quite sure what ears you need to find that are receptive to wisdom. Because they have to recognize wisdom. And they have to recognize it intuitively. And I'm not quite sure who out there is ready to embrace that wisdom and then apply it. 